Good afternoon, everybody. This is Ben Tomczyk with the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. I uh, want to say thank you for joining this afternoon. Um, first off, we hope everyone is doing well and staying safe. In addition to that, um, we do want to do a few quick housekeeping reminders before we get started. Uh, first off, we will be recording this webinar. And then the second thing is that we will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. So please um, go to the bottom of your screen and you will see a Q&A feature. Please feel free to type in your questions there and then Mark will be taking questions after our presentation. Uh, as many of you know, yesterday, uh, late yesterday, the Senate passed legislation providing for additional economic relief in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so what we thought we'd do today was give a little overview of the legislation uh, in addition to that, also a new project the committee has just launched in response to the COVID pandemic, and then take your questions. And so right now, I want to um, welcome my colleague, Mark Goldwine, uh, who is Senior Vice President at the committee to um, give a presentation and to kick things off. Mark? Well, thank you all for um, joining me here in my living room. Uh, you have to bear with me as I get through the technology and share my screen. But um, for those that don't know me, and most of you do, my name is Mark Goldwine. I'm the Senior Vice President here at the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget um, and have um, I, I lead our policy team. And so if you are not on our mailing list, you should be at crfb.org. But if you are, um, any of the papers, blogs, and other products you get um, have, have come across my desk. What I want to do today is relatively briefly talk about the legislation that that passed the senate yesterday and is likely i think very likely to pass the house tomorrow and become law um, and then i want to put it in a broader context um, what i'm not going to spend a lot of time doing today but i'm happy to in questions um, is talk about what got us here i think that um, many folks have already been on a number of these calls and i've presented them but um, in light of the public health crisis we are currently facing um, we made a decision as a, as a society to essentially shut down large parts of the economy, um, to tell people to stay in their homes instead of going out and presuming commerce, and to tell people to stay at homes instead of going out and going to work. And the result inevitably um, is a deep economic decline. And the hope is that we can limit that economic decline to the size and time period of the lockdowns. But the fear is that what starts is the inevitable decline for people not going to work, people not buying, um, spirals into something much deeper or much longer lasting. And so a lot of the legislation that's being enacted right now is trying to provide the economic relief to prevent that downward and onward spiral. Now what we passed yesterday, everyone should be able to see my screen. Um, what we passed yesterday um, is something called the Paycheck Protection Program and Healthcare Enhancement Act. And I, I do want to apologize. It looks like my screen is reacting a little slowly to my uh, keyboard, but hopefully you'll, you'll um, be able to tag along. Uh, the Paycheck Protection Program and Healthcare Enhancement Act is basically a $500 billion piece of legislation, which ordinarily we would think of as very large. Um, but it's mostly an add-on to what was a $2 trillion piece of legislation passed a couple of weeks ago called the CARES Act. And so many people you might hear are calling this CARES 2.5 because it's sort of an extension of the CARES Act, or they're calling it um, phase three and a half of COVID relief because we had, this is the fourth piece of legislation, but again, it mostly goes in the third. And it mainly has um, what I think of as three components. Component number one, it essentially replenishing of the Paycheck Protection Program. The Paycheck Protection Program um, is, a grant and loan program for small businesses, businesses less than 500 people, where essentially um, these businesses can borrow 10 weeks worth of payroll. And so long as they use that money, it's more complicated, but essentially so long as they use that money in part to retain all their employees and pay them mostly their full pay, um, that loan is forgiven. It is a, um, essentially turns into a grant or turns mostly into a grant. And um, during the CARES Act, we funded this program with about $350 billion. But um, in, in this new bill, we've added another 310. So we've almost doubled it. It's not quite, but from 350 to about 660. Um, of that, we're saying 60 billion is specifically dedicated 
um, or specifically needs to go through small banks, credit unions, and other community financial institutions in an effort to try to kind of get to, um, to the smaller lenders that um, weren't as strong in the first round. In addition, um, the legislation funds another 60 billion of what's called economic injury disaster loans. Now, whereas the Paycheck Protection Program really is mostly a grant, it's forgivable, the economic injury disaster loans are loans. And these have existed for a while. They're usually used in places that face a natural disaster, like a place that has a hurricane. Um, but we recently expanded them um, to essentially consider the entire thing that we're in a disaster, which makes sense. Um, but the loan program wasn't nearly large enough to deal with the idea of a national disaster. And so we put $50 billion in this fund, which we think will be enough to give about $300 billion worth of loans, under the assumption that most of that money will be paid back, but some of it will be, will be lost by businesses that unfortunately um, go under or unable to pay it back. We also created a $10 billion advance. Essentially, um, businesses that apply for this loan can also apply to get $10,000 immediately, and we put another $10 billion in that. And then the last piece is um, we expanded healthcare funding by about $100 billion. Um, $75 billion of that is increasing funding to hospitals and other providers that are dealing on the front line with this COVID crisis, providers um, that really don't have enough money um, to treat the COVID patients on the one hand, and on the other hand are actually losing a lot of money because they've canceled all um, elective and semi-elective procedures um, on the other. And then $25 billion to try to dramatically expand COVID testing, including some money for the state, some money for NIH, some for community health center, CDC, a variety of other, other sources to try to get better testing developed and more importantly, to start manufacturing the testing so we can understand how prevalent this is. So um, to visualize this is a little bit in money terms. As I mentioned, it's roughly a $500 billion legislation. That's really the deficit impact. Overall, this bill is gonna add about $472 billion to the deficit, that's how much new money. But in order to get $472 billion um, to the deficit, it's actually going in the near term, offer a lot more support because it has these, mainly because it has these loans that get paid back. So by our estimates in the near term, this legislation is actually gonna provide as much as $733 billion um, worth of money out there a large share of which will be paid back, which is how we get to the 472 um, net number. Now, why? What was the purpose of this legislation? We talked about the overarching um, reason, the, the, the um, you know, the, the, the COVID um, recession. Some people are calling it the Great Suppression. Um, but what we've seen in the last couple of weeks really, I think, was a loud blinking light or a bright blinking light that, that action needs to be taken. Unemployment claims have essentially averaged 7 um, million per week. Um, if you look historically, we've never really crossed 600,000 in a given week. In the Great Recession, unemployment claims were bad, but they were spread out over a long period of time. You can see my mouse. This is happening all at once. As businesses are shutting down or temporarily closing, they're fur furloughing those workers or laying them off. Um, we don't know how many are total are unemployed, but we know that 22 million in the last three weeks applied for unemployment benefits. And unlike during the Great Recession, where some people were being hired, very, very few people are being hired in the, in the, in the near term. So unemployment is very high. And the idea of the Paycheck Protection Program is, is in part to prevent people from making it onto the unemployment rolls in the first place, because we pay businesses essentially to hold on to their workers, even if their workers aren't um, providing enough to otherwise be worth it, even if their workers are, are partially or fully furloughed. At the same time, it was clear that in some areas, as big as the CARES Act was, um, the CARES Act was falling short. So this is an infographic we had of the sort of the appropriations of the CARES Act. On the left side, this is sort of the form the money came from, and the right side, this is where it went. Overall, I think the CARES Act was a um, very important piece of legislation. Um, nobody would argue it's perfect, but um, given the speed with which they put it through, it provided a lot of important um, support. But it turns out that when it came to the small business loans and when it came to the money for health providers, um, it didn't provide enough, at least as much enough compared to intended. How do we know that? Well, let's take a look at the Paycheck Protection Program as an example. They provided $349 billion for loans. Um, in the first few days, not many banks had sort of figured out how to use it. But um, you know, the program started April 2nd, essentially. 
by April 7th, the bank started to figure it out between April 7th and April 16th. So essentially April 15th. So essentially over one week, um, basically the entirety of that fund was gone. More businesses that had, had applied than could get it. In fact, I've heard from a number of businesses that actually applied, you know, this program goes to the banks. The bank approved them. And then they were told a few days later that the bank went to the SBA, the Small Business Administration, and the money had run out. So what happened with the Paycheck Protection Program is at sort of an alarming pace, the money ran out. And so it was clear we needed more money to continue just this current version of the program. Um, so it's clear, again, this is also true of the economic injury loans, and um, which you know, were supposed to give up to $10 million. In many cases, rumors are they were capping loans at 15,000. It's clear there were some areas where there just wasn't enough money to meet the, to meet the ideas the programs um, were aiming for. Now, in light of all this, the government is going to be spending a lot of money. They're going to be putting out a lot of loans, um, issuing a lot of loans, a lot of grants, a lot of loan guarantees, new spending, tax breaks, et cetera. And we understand why they have to move fast. We understand why this legislation cannot get the normal hearing that it would for regular legislation. It can't go through the committee process. But that doesn't mean it doesn't deserve oversight. In fact, oversight and transparency is on the back end is even more important because we don't have to evaluate in the front end. And in that light, um, the CRFB, Committee for Responsible Federal Budget, created a new project, COVID Money Tracker. Um, you can visit it at covidmoneytracker.org, which is really going to follow every dollar spent. And just to kind of um, give you some context, we did exactly the same thing back in 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, during the Great Recession. We created a website, stimulus.org, which tried to track every single thing and um, every single action that was undertaken to fight the recession, whether it was from the Federal Reserve expanding their balance sheet, the government offering more guarantees, um, new spending programs, new tax cuts, the FDIC taking over banks. We tracked everything. We followed how much was the maximum amount allowed, how much we followed the money as it was spent out, and we estimated the deficit impact. And we created a, an online portal where people could see this all in a ways that were sortable, searchable, collapsible. Um, and we're gonna do the same thing this time with COVID Money Tracker. Now it turns out you can't build a website, you can't build a state-of-the-art interactive database in a day. So until we have this database up, we're starting with the static version. And this should just give you a summary of here's where we are. Um, so far, lawmakers have essentially um, enacted about $4 trillion worth of fiscal support. Um, that's 3.6 trillion from legislation, about 400 billion from administrative action. Of that, it will result in deficit increases over 2.5 trillion. The difference being that some of these are loans, some of these are advanced um, advancements or deferrals, and so some of the money that's supporting the economy in 2020 is actually going to be recovered in 2021 or 2022 and beyond. But we're talking about four trillion dollars in near-term support for two and a half trillion of total support on the fiscal side, mainly from legislation, um, which you can see here, and another. $2 trillion to date of support from the Federal Reserve, mainly through asset purchases and loans. Um, through facilities, essentially, the Federal Reserve has enacted that they've allowed themselves to create at least $9 trillion of support. That doesn't mean we'll do the full $9 trillion, but that's what they've announced so far. And so um, we're going to track this program by program, agency by agency. You can see we're not just at the top level. Here's some of the legislation that's passed that we've been following. You know, we've been looking at the money as it's been spending out, spend out. We know they allowed for 150 billion of aid to states. 42 billion of that is out the door already. Um, in subsequent versions, we're going to tell you exactly how much each state is getting. Similarly, of the 293 billion of tax rebates, 150 billion is out the door. We're going to be tracking of the Federal Reserve facilities out of 450, 185 is out the door. We're going to be tracking all this money. And again, not just the federal fiscal side. We're also going to be tracking the Federal Federal Reserve, which has undertaken. It's revived a number of extraordinary measures from the Great Recession, but also created a number of new extraordinary measures, including new facilities to lend money to small businesses, to buy municipal bonds from cities and states, um, to um, engage in a bunch of repo operations, to essentially swap different types of assets to give banks short-term lending, um, to dramatically expand its balance sheet, to put more cash in the economy, and so on and so on. Um, so we're gonna be tracking this. I welcome questions. Check out COVID money, so excuse me, covidmoneytracker.org. Um, in advance of that interactive database, we're going to have new substance coming out every day or every couple of days. So what does this all mean? First of all, 
um, the federal balance sheet is expanding dramatically. You know, prior to the Great Recession, for a very long time, the Federal Reserve had about a trillion dollars worth of assets, and they used that to try to manage interest rates. During the Great Recession, we immediate, pretty immediately doubled that to try to rescue the economy, and then gradually ramped it up to about four trillion. So we gradually quadrupled it. Just in the last few weeks, just in the last, I should say, month and a half, we've gone up another two trillion. Um, so, and we're likely to go up at least two trillion more in the next few months, and possibly as much as eight trillion more based on on other pieces. The Fed is dramatically expanding its balance sheet. At the same time, and in some ways relatedly, the federal government um, is spending, and it's spending um, not in unprecedented quantities, but at unprecedented speed. Why do I say that? Because um, so far, the amount that we've spent to combat the COVID crisis is actually about the same as the amount that we spent to combat the Great Recession. The difference is the legislation that we, and the numbers are higher, but the economy is larger. So as a share of the economy is about the same size. The difference is over the Great Recession, we passed numerous pieces of legislation, maybe 10 or more pieces of legislation, and we spread out the support over about a five or six year period. This is sort of the, the stimulus over the Great Recession. You can see in 2008, um, when it started, we spent some, in 2009, we spent more, and then we kind of gradually ramped it back down. For the COVID crisis, we're spending about the same amount as during the Great Recession, but instead of spending it over six years, we're spending most of it over six months. 90% of the money we've allocated so far will be spent over the next six months. And as a result, um, we're gonna have about 10% of GDP this year, based on current legislation, just a fiscal support. Um, and when you add that to the underlying um, deficits and you add that to the effect of the economy, the budget deficit this year will be $3.8 trillion. Last year was less than a trillion. This year's gonna be 3.8. The deficits we are projecting will quadruple. And while they will come down in subsequent years, um, we estimate they're gonna remain higher than, than they've been projected indefinitely. And that's without more legislation. Um, this, by the way, means that our debt is gonna also rise dramatically. The beginning of this year, debt was about 80% of GDP. We project by the end of this year, it will be 100% of GDP. Um, and with only a few years, debt will reach record levels. Um, the previous record set in World War II was 106% of GDP. We are going to likely blow past that. Even, you know, these are relatively optimistic scenarios because they assume no more legislation and a relatively robust um, recovery. Even in that circumstance, we are headed for record high levels of debt. Um, and by the way, um, today's Social Security and Trustees, Social Security and Medicare Trustees reports came out. They don't account for, for the coronavirus, but when we add that in, we also are going to face several trust funds that are on the brink of insolvency. Um, so at this point, I would just love to take some questions. Uh, thanks so much, Mark. Um, just want to remind folks that if you do have questions, please use the chat feature and um, we will uh, be, be taking questions. Uh, Mark, I want to start with, we're getting a lot of questions on the PPP. And so one of the first questions we got was, was there any logic as to how much money was um, given to the PPP in this latest round of legislation, considering how fast it ran out with the CARES Act? That, that's a really good question. Um, let me start with this. I don't expect the money to go as fast this time as it did with the CARES Act, because the CARES Act actually did sweep up a lot of the need. Okay, so um, it's important to remember that just because it was going that fast in the CARES Act doesn't mean it's gonna keep going that fast. With that said, I do think it's very probable that the money is gonna run out again. Um, my understanding of the logic here um, wasn't that good. They essentially, there essentially is an estimate there's about a trillion small business payroll out there total. Um, and there was a feeling that essentially half of that would, would need support. And so, um, the 350 we started with plus the um, the 250 more actually gets us to 600 billion, which is more than that. And then there was a little bit of horse trading. Um, Democrats wanted special money for smaller banks. Republicans didn't want to carve it out as so they added up. And so there was some horse trading to get that last bit. But um, their goal, I think, is is to, to in rough justice cover the amount of money that's needed. The problem is. Um, I'm fearful that's not going to work because more businesses are going to take money than is needed. 
this is not a perfectly targeted program. If it was a perfectly targeted program and we could design it well, it probably actually has more money than it needs, but it's not perfectly targeted. It's going to give um, some businesses too little and other businesses big windfalls and we can't really prevent that. And so my guess is the money will run out again and we may be back here again in a few weeks for a third round. Um, I, in response to a few questions we have had, yes, we will be sending this presentation out. Um, one other question we had about PPP and um, COVID money tracker, will the database um, allow people to see um, what is being allocated by state? And will that also include being able to see which uh, businesses in those states got um, PPP funding or a PPP loan, excuse Great. me? Great question. So our goal with the interactive database is to get as granular as we are able to. Um, that is easier to do when we're looking at um, things like the Fed lending facilities, where they're giving a lot of big loans to big companies. I'll give you another example where it's relatively easy to do. Um, so this is something we're starting on. Uh, excuse me. This is something we're starting on related to one part of the CARES Act, because the CARES Act isn't just the, the Paycheck Protection Program. There's lots of elements. One element of it was a special $25 billion fund to essentially help airlines keep their employees. Um, and, you know, because people are not flying airlines or essentially have no need for 90% of their employees, but we don't really want them to lay them off. And so the legislation allows for about $25 billion. Already, $22 billion of that has been allocated as you can see here. It's been through a mixture of grants and loans. The grants are the money that's really focused directly on the on um, supporting the, the pay of the of the furloughed workers, the loans for a variety of sources. But we're tracking by airline. You know, Alaska Airlines got almost a, almost a, a billion, so does JetBlue. Um, Hawaiian Airlines, 300 million. Southwest, 3.3 billion. Still between loans and grants. We're going to do this for every program to the greatest level of detail that we can. Now, for the Paycheck Protection Program in particular, this is a bit harder because we're not talking about 10 airlines or even 100 businesses. We are talking about thousands and tens of thousands of businesses, um, some taking loans of $15,000. And we're not necessarily going to go and say, well, you know, mom and pops down the street that took a $15,000 loan from Paycheck Protection. But we are going to give the level of data we can. So here's a few things we know. This is um, from USA Facts, which is another great website. They've tracked it by state. And so this is the number of loans by state. You can see to some degree it's associated with population, which makes sense. Um, but Texas did quite well in the page of protection. Florida, relative to its size, did quite, did quite well. Um, a lot of states didn't do as well. Um, this is another way to look at the data. This is, this is ours. This is based on industry, right? So um, we're not necessarily going to tell you kind of every Ruth's Chris at this point because we still don't have that data. But we do know. Um, about 13% of the money went to construction, um, which is interesting because you would think that um, construction would not be as shut down as some of these other, you know, um, other industries. Another 12% went to manufacturing. On the other hand, you know, what's the industries we think of as really um, having to totally shut down food services and retail? Um, they got about eight or 9% each. Um, now we need to cut these numbers different ways. We need to know what is this compared to their total size, compared to their total revenue loss, et cetera. We're not there yet but we're gonna give as much detail as possible. And before the interactive database is ready, we're gonna do these one-off studies like this. So please email us with any ideas you have about how we can break down the data. And if we can do it, we will try to do it. And um, if you, have any, if, um, you wanna to donate to CRFB to help support us in those efforts, um, please do check out crfb.org. We would appreciate your support. Uh, Mark, uh, another question. Were there any industries that, um, you know, have not gotten funding or not gotten financial support either from the CARES Act or uh, this latest round of legislation? So there are a lot of industries that have not yet gotten support. Um, the, the CARES Act really focused on um, a, few, a few areas. It focused on giving cash to individuals. It focused on people that are unemployed. Um, it focused on airlines and, and other businesses that are really important to national security. It focused on hospital systems. It focused a bit on states. And then it focused on small businesses. And small meaning 500 or less plus change. So some, some actually significant size businesses. What it didn't do directly was, was very large businesses and corporations. Um, instead, um, the logic was 
it created indirect support for these large corporations and businesses by helping the Federal Reserve to fund a facility. Essentially, the Federal Reserve is now allowed to give 450, sorry, $4.5 trillion worth of loans out to large businesses as well as small businesses in states and municipalities um, with a, a backstop so that they can't possibly lose money because the, the Treasury will cover the difference. And those, those lending facilities have just gotten up and running and they haven't yet done the lending. And so the large corporations haven't seen money yet, but I expect that a lot of them will. Remember, they have cash, they have liquidity, they have time. That doesn't mean they're not all hurting. Large companies, unless they're, um, you know, a large company that's really specialized in, um, you know, on, in like delivery or online services, they're all hurting too, but they have a lot more ability to cushion the blow for a while. And so it's not as important to get the money to them fast as it is to get to them intelligently. And the hope is that the Federal Reserve will be able to give them loans that they can finance over a long period of time and pay back. The only industry that I'm really aware of that's probably not going to get anything at the, at the moment is the cruise industry. Um, they're suffering really bad as a result of this crisis, but most of them are um, not based in the United States. Um, they, they're based in some other country. And so there doesn't appear there's going to be a lot of federal support for them. Uh, let me, I'm going to combine two questions here. Would you describe um, what is what passed the Senate yesterday and will be considered by the House tomorrow is this phase 3.1, 3.5, phase four. And additionally, you also heard a bunch of um, senators talk about, you know, there will be a next, it seems like there will be a next phase after this bill um, gets voted on tomorrow. So what will that entail? Great question. So. Everyone's going to have their own name for this phase. The reason some people are calling it 3.5 is that this is, for the most part, an extension of the CARES Act. It was where the CARES Act appears to not have had a lot of money. Um, but there's some new things in it, again, including $25 billion for COVID testing, which I think everybody understands is really important if we can want to reopen the economy in any kind of significant way. So it's semantics, whether you want to call it phase four or phase 3.5 or anything like that. The important thing is it's putting more money into a lot of these programs. There almost definitely will be a phase four. Um, I will say we are out of the woods in terms of when we have to rush so fast on legislation that we really don't have time to get it right. Um, I think the, the thing about the CARES Act and even the subsequent piece was um, the most important priority was to get the legislation fast. And if we had to waste some dollars and if some money has to go to people that are not deserving and businesses are not deserving, that was okay because expedience was so important. There are areas of the economy that will still need more money and more support. Um, the CARES Act probably, what we've passed so far probably is about the right size for what the economy needs. And I can talk about why later, but because a lot of it didn't go to the right places, there are still places that probably need money, but we now have time to breathe, to sit, to think, and to carefully decide where should the next dollars go and how should they be designed to get there efficiently. And that's what we should do. There are gonna be more rounds, I think that um, front of the list, there probably needs to meet substantially more money for states and localities that are losing revenue. But states and localities aren't at risk of going bankrupt tomorrow. They have rainy day funds. They have tax capacity. They're going to have the ability to borrow from the Fed. They're not going to run out of money tomorrow. So we should think carefully, what is the best and fairest way to get the money, the way that's going to give them the most support and also help them to get back on their own feet when this whole thing is over. Uh, we're getting a lot of questions also about, you know, what will be the, you know, what is going to be the overall effect on the debt? And is, is at this point, is fiscal responsibility a lost cause or can we do something to get our fiscal house in order to leave a better future for, you know, our children and grandchildren? So assuming, let's, let me start with some context. Um, through most of U.S. history, debt has been about 40% of the economy, maybe 50%. You know, it's been half the economy. We had a huge spike in World War II where it exceeded the size of the economy briefly. And then as soon as the war was over, we ran a series of balanced budgets or close to balanced budgets um, and got the debt back to its normal 40%. That's not been the case recently. Since the Great Recession, you know, but the course of the Great Recession, debt rose from about its historic average to about 70%. Since the bulk of the Great Recession ended, we've continued to increase debt. And in fact, the last five years during the strong economy, instead of taking that period, taking advantage of that period like every other country did to put our fiscal house in order, we passed 
five trillion dollars worth of tax cuts and spending increases. We increased spending, we cut taxes the opposite. And as a result, we actually came into this thing with trillion dollar deficits. We'd never had trillion dollar deficits in the time of good economy before. Um, now we came into this in a bad fiscal situation. Trillion dollar deficits, 80% of GDP. That does not mean that we don't need to borrow more. There are times that it's justifiable to borrow a lot. And the basically the two key ones are when you're in a recession or when you face a national emergency. Um, right now we're in both. And so we need this borrowing. You know, when you're, the farm is on fire, you don't worry about whether you have enough water to make it through the next few crop seasons. You put out the fire and that's what we have to do. But that doesn't mean that borrowing is free. It does not mean that it's debt is inconsequential. The borrowing we are doing today is going to have implications on tomorrow. It is going to reduce wages, reduce productive capacity, reduce government capacity tomorrow. And so when we get to the other side of this thing, it's actually more important than ever that we return to fiscal responsibility. We'll be facing record high levels of debt once we get through this. And we'll be facing, um, I wouldn't be surprised if we face a Medicare trust fund projected to be insolvent by 2022 or 2023, the disability trust fund by 2025, and the old age trust fund, the highway trust fund by 2021, and the old age trust fund by 2030. We're gonna have to get these programs, these social insurance and trust fund programs in order very fast. And after we do, we're gonna have to deal with the underlying debt situation. Uh, otherwise, we're not gonna be prepared for the next crisis. And there will be another crisis. Uh, going back to borrowing, um, can you talk about you know, where we're getting the money from to pay for this, where we're getting the money from to borrow this. Is this foreign countries? Is this, you know, the public? Can, can you dive a little bit deeper into that? Right. So look, so debt is bought on a, in a marketplace. And in some sense, the way we're getting the money to borrow for this is that we are selling our bonds and people are buying them, both individuals and foreigners. But in another way, in an indirect way, actually the Federal Reserve right now is covering a lot of the difference. It's the very same time that the that you know the United States is projected to issue um, 3.8 trillion dollars of debt. In fact, we've issued one trillion dollars of debt just over the last 30 days. Um, I'm stalling to get to the right chart, but over that same last 30 days that we've issued one trillion dollars of new debt, the Federal Reserve, um, the Federal Reserve has essentially bought a trillion dollars more of treasuries, right? So this is this kind of part, they've increased their treasury holdings by about a trillion dollars. Meaning, while the Federal Reserve didn't buy money from the federal government, that's not how it works, they bought it from the markets, effectively for this first trillion, the Federal Reserve covered the difference. Um, foreigners and, and Americans bought the debt, but then the Federal Reserve bought other debt from them. Um, that may be how this goes for a lot of this. The Federal Reserve may um, be buying a lot of our debt. This isn't quite the same as monetizing the debt because the Federal Reserve isn't printing the money out of nowhere. They're actually taking bank reserves, interest bearing bank reserves. But in some ways, this kind of resembles a partial monetization of the debt. Um, this is not something you can do to a great degree in normal times, but it is something that you have an ability to do when, when you have huge shocks in, in demand and um, huge liquidity crisis used like we, like we have um, now. And at some point, the Fed may have to figure out how to unwind to prevent inflation. But as I said, that's a tomorrow problem. Right now, we need to worry about this national emergency. Following up on that, when you, you talked in your presentation about the Fed doing extraordinary measures, can you help people understand what does that exactly mean? So um, in ordinary times, the main way the Federal Reserve influences the economy is through our operations to try to influence short-term interest rates, essentially mostly selling short-term bonds. Um, they already cut their interest rate to zero. They did that as March 15th. So um, that's no longer an option. The second way the Federal Reserve, which they've done, which is sort of new to um, since 2008, it's not been, it hadn't really been done except for during the Great Depression since until 2008. The second way the Federal Reserve influences the economy is essentially by putting more cash out there there's something called quantitative easing. And the typical way they do that is they take assets that are cash-like, cash value, but aren't very liquid, meaning long-term treasury bonds. And so somebody's holding a 10-year treasury bond worth $100. The Fed says, I'm gonna give you $100 cash in exchange for that. And they swap it. No more assets are created, right? The Fed just swapped cash for 10-year treasury bonds, but they just made things more liquid because there's now more cash in the economy that people can spend. So the Federal Reserve is already doing a lot of that. 
Where the extraordinary measures are is now the Fed is going beyond either of those things, um, operating as its lender of last resort um, function, but way more than it typically has. Sometimes the Federal Reserve lends money to other banks, especially on a temporary basis. They have sort of two key ways they do that. One is called the discount window for banks that are in trouble. It is the overnight window for banks that have fast operations. They're doing both of those, but then they're doing all sorts of other stuff that's really unusual. Um, they are buying a large part, portion of mortgage-backed securities. Um, they are buying the paycheck protection loans actually off of the small banks, off of the banks so they don't have to hold them. They are starting to buy um, municipal bonds and corporate bonds. They're sending facilities to actually buy debt in companies and in state and local governments, which is not something they've really ever done um, except for, for a few financial institutions. Um, and they're going to be coming up with all sorts of um, new facilities and new ideas on top of that. Um, they are basically finding every way they can to get money into the economy um, and to remove risk from the economy. So they are offering loans. They are buying assets. They are trying to get money out um, to, and take the risk in themselves. Uh, looking long term, someone asked, you know, what does all this mean for the 2021 appropriations process? <laughs> um, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, I don't think anyone's even thinking about the 2021 appropriations process um, at the moment. I do imagine that um, separate from the crisis that's going on now, a new president always likes the option to, to have some ability to set his or her own appropriations agenda. And because nobody ever knows the results of the election in advance, it's pretty common for appropriations processes before presidential elections to find a way to kick the can to March or so. So I think even in ordinary times, I wouldn't be surprised to see continuing resolutions that took us to March of 2021 as opposed to October. Um, given the current crisis, I mean, it's anyone's guess. Uh, we have time for, for one more question. Um, and that is, we've seen a lot of news stories about who's getting the, these um, PPP loans, you know, is there, will the government be undertaking any sort of audit or any sort of, you know, report to look at, you know, did the, did the um, stimulus money, or excuse me, did the recovery money get to the right industries, get to the right people? What is sort of going to be, you know, what happens after this to, to see, did we do this right? Yeah, I think it's a really important question because um, if this crisis continues, we may need a second round of paycheck protection or something like it. In other words, this basically gives companies 10 weeks, you know, eight weeks of payroll, two weeks of everything else, let's say. Um, we may need a second round of this, and we shouldn't do a second round until we know the money got to the right to the right place. I think we already know that the design of the program means that it's not all getting to the right place. Um, the paycheck protection program is, in my opinion, a pretty well targeted to a business that is partially shut down, but still some operations. So take, for example, um, a restaurant that's had to close down their bar and close down the restaurant, but they continue to take out. Maybe their revenue has fallen by 70%, but they're still bringing in 30% of revenue. The combination of that 37% of revenue plus the paycheck protection loan with the forgiveness is probably enough for them for a while. Um, the paycheck protection program, on the other hand, is probably too little money for businesses that are fully shut down, right? So think retail stores with no online presence. Um, they're fully shut down. Um, the fact that they're having eight weeks of payroll covered plus 33% is probably not going to be enough uh, to, to prevent, to kind of keep them afloat unless they have a lot of cash because they still have all sorts of other fixed expenses that they're not able to cover. And then on the other hand, the Paycheck Protection Program is probably offering too much to businesses that are fully operational but suffering from the lack of demand in the economy right now. You know, so maybe their revenue is down 20%. That's a bad, that's bad for your revenue about 20%. But if your revenue is down 20%, you don't need a government program to cover 100% of, 133% of your wages. That's just too much. And so we know this isn't perfectly targeted. Um, it's never be perfectly targeted. But in the next round, I would hope we at least do better than that. And, and um, we can see anecdotally um, places where we're not doing better than that, places where businesses that clearly have the liquidity that don't need this as much are getting it. But the with such a big program, the anecdotes aren't going to be too important. What we actually need to do is dig into the data 
Um, and what we actually need to do is see which businesses are staying afloat and which ones are shutting down. Um, and as we see that, we'll maybe give a better sense of whether this program deserves renewal and, and what kind of changes should be made to it to better target it. Meanwhile, COVID money tracker will be following the whole thing as closely as we can. Well, thanks so much, Mark. And before we wrap up for today, I uh, want to answer a few more questions we've gotten from folks online. Um, if you'd like to learn more about COVID Money Tracker, you can go to covidmoneytracker.org. Uh, we'll also be sending a link out um, to the site uh, tomorrow as a follow-up from this call, along with Mark's presentation. Additionally, um, some of you have also asked, um, you know, how can I support this program financially? please feel free to go to crfb.org slash support. Again, crfb.org slash support. Uh, on behalf of everyone at the committee, we want to thank you for joining in today. Uh, please stay well, and we look forward to catching up with you on a future webinar. Thank you so much, everybody.